You are listening to More Than a Song, episode 403. Hello, and welcome to this episode of More Than a Song. My name is Michelle Nizat, and this is the podcast dedicated to helping you discover the truth of Scripture, hidden in today's popular Christian music. My goal is to teach you to connect portions of God's Word with the songs you're singing along with on the radio, to help you meditate on truths that will transform your way of thinking and ultimately your life. There are some words that are so descriptive that when you say them, it's like your body wants to respond. The word tremble is one of those words for me. And that's why I loved the song so much when I heard it for the first time as Lauren Daigle sang it at a concert recently. And so when a listener requested this song, I trembled with excitement. See what I did there? Uh, Seriously. It's been an interesting journey through scripture for me this week. I can't wait to take you along for the ride. But first, let's listen. Whenever a word like this jumps out of the lyrics for me, it's a natural next step to take the bite of studying it in scripture as a topic. Now, bite, B-I-T-E, stands for Bible Interaction Tool Exercise, and these are just the exercises I use to interact with God's Word. It, It helps me keep my time in God's Word varied. Now, because I don't want you to just read the Bible, although that's a great first step, I really want you to interact with it. Why? Because you'll get so much more out of it. You know, the Bible is designed as a book that you can study for life, and it will show off facet after facet like a sparkling gem for as long as you are willing to examine it. So when I opened up my online Bible website, my favorite one is BibleHub.com, I just typed in the word tremble into the keyword search and then just started digging in. And it can be as simple as that. You just find inspiration and then dig in. And once you land in a place, then you use the another bite like reading in context or reading, keep on reading to learn all you can about what the text actually says. You see, your first goal when you begin to interact with God's word for yourself is to read what the text actually says. And then you move to what it means before you move into what it means for me. And you notice I said for me, not to me. You know, the text can't mean something to you that it doesn't mean. Perhaps it speaks something specific in your heart, in your life, but it can't change meaning. It may be more significant to you in that moment. It may resound in your spirit, but it cannot change meaning. And that's why it's so important to know what the text actually says for ourselves. And you can do this. I know it's work. I know it's hard. I know that you've uh, run into some obstacles, but and I, I understand that. I understand that's why you pick it up and you put it down and you pick it up and you put it down. But the work is worth it. And then my bites, hopefully, can help take away one of the obstacles, the what do I do next obstacle. Just take another bite. All right. So one of the trembling verses is found in Psalm 2. Verse 11 says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So this advice is actually near the end of the psalm in a section that begins with the word therefore, meaning this is the conclusion of the psalmist after describing some other things. I had a pastor who would always say, if you see the word therefore, you need to look up above that to see what that was there for. (laughs) So um, what I did next was just read the whole psalm so I could see what the opening um, argument was that the conclusion was that we should fear Uh, the Lord and serve him with fear and rejoice with trembling. So all 12 verses, right? So (laughs) that's how you read in context in a psalm. I actually read that psalm every day for several days. So not only did I read in context, which is one bite, but I used the bite of repetition to keep my mind pondering what I was reading. Now, when you read the psalm for yourself, Psalm chapter, Psalm 2, you will find that this advice was given to cultures and governments of the earth who would try to ignore God and revolt against him, concluding that, so the conclusion again of that psalm is that the best option is to honor God and to serve him. So thus it says, it's better to serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. 
And in case you think that this advice is only for kings and countries alone, or perhaps you believe the Old Testament advice is old, let's take the bite of following the cross-reference to the New Testament. So because the words fear and trembling will show up there again in several places. In fact, if you follow the challenge from last week, it may have uh, jumped to your mind that it like it did for me this week because you would have read that phrase, fear and trembling. We only touched on the first chapter of 1 Corinthians last week and then a few verses into the second chapter. We were right there in the thick of it when Paul said these words to the Corinthian church. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. What was that all about? So we're going to read it in context to see. Just to be clear, when I say read in context, I can usually see the context of a verse by reading the chapter before, the chapter that the verse is in, and then the chapter after. It's not a rule or a definition. It's more of a guideline. For example, if it's a psalm, as I mentioned before, then to read in context is just to read the entire psalm. It is complete in itself. It's not a chapter of a book. If it's a letter, I normally recommend reading the entire letter. So if you followed the challenge last week, then you read the entire letter to the Corinthians last week. So this week, if you if you did that, then I would read chapters one through three just to remind you of the context of what we're about to talk about today. In this section of the letter to the Corinthian church, Paul was reminding the Corinthian church that the gospel you know, the good news of Christ was nothing like anything they had ever known. You know, the Greco-Roman world of that day placed a high value on professional orators. They, They could persuade the audience through entertaining instruction. The better the presenter, the greater the chance the idea that they were pitching would persuade the crowd. And then enter Paul. You know, he's preaching the gospel, you know, the good news that Jesus, God incarnate, came to earth, suffered and died a brutal Roman death on a cross, only to rise to life again and ascend to the Father where he makes intercession for us. And if we place our faith in this God man, Jesus, we can have eternal life and a restored relationship with God that was broken because of sin. Here's the problem. That story didn't resonate with the audience. Paul explains in verse 22 when he says, Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. What what he was pointing out was something that we read in the Gospels. You know, let's take the Jews, for example. Next time you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, look for all the times that they kept asking Jesus for signs and miracles. It's like they were saying, prove to us that you're worthy of our faith through the signs and the miracles. Of course, it didn't matter how many signs and miracles Jesus performed. It was never enough for most people, especially the religious elite. I mean, he raised people from the dead, for goodness sakes. But anyway, what about the Greeks? Uh, They viewed themselves as a cultured people. They valued rhetoric and debate. And rhetoric is the effective use of language. So an entertaining and persuasive speaker would be held in high esteem in that culture. Something that was flashy and high-minded would really draw in the crowds. So when we read verse 23... We see Paul's but statement. You know, verse 22 again says, Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. Verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. As my ESV study Bible, one of my favorite outside resources that I use, teaches, it said this, a crucified Messiah was offensive to an unbelieving Jew. You see, they believed that to die in that way meant that Jesus was cursed. So in their mind, how could the Messiah, the anointed one, die in a way that meant he was cursed? It just didn't make sense to them. And it would really be a stumbling block to a Jew coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And then what about the Greeks? Well, Jesus didn't fit the profile of a Messiah for them either. Wouldn't a true Messiah command a stage and influence those in power? He wouldn't die like a common criminal on a cross with just a handful of followers, raised from the dead or not. So to them, the message of the cross was just silly. So how crazy was Paul to preach about something that would lose the audience from the beginning? You know, what what unbelievers don't understand then and now is Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And as verse 25 teaches us, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 
The unbelieving Jews and Greeks were assessing the message through the wisdom of their religion and through the, the lens of what they valued. They just thought power and wisdom were important. And as Paul reminds us, they are. You know, his power and his wisdom, God's power, God's wisdom is extremely important. It just looks different to God than it does to people. In fact, God's wisdom and power, God is so much greater than anything we can imagine that what we call power and wisdom is laughable to God. You know, it just kind of harkens me back to Psalm 2 since I spent so much time there this week. There's a, a, a phrase in verse 4. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Our power and wisdom as discussed in 1 Corinthians or our plans as discussed in Psalm 2, all of these things are laughable to God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So if you followed the cross-reference to Acts chapter 18 last week, this is what you discovered. You, you could kind of be, see where the Corinthian church began. Paul was originally preaching in the synagogue, but the Jews there opposed and insulted him. So he left the synagogue and he went next door to the house of a believer and focused his preaching efforts on the Gentiles. Now the leader of the synagogue and his household placed their faith in Christ. His name was Crispus. And I'm sure Crispus's influence in the Jewish, Jewish community meant that this church, even though it kind of uh, wasn't really born out of the synagogue, they, they rejected him over there at the synagogue. I'm sure there was still quite a few Jews and Gentiles together at this church. And of course, it's also a cosmopolitan city. I mentioned that last week with people coming in from all over the empire. And so there were deep Jewish, deep, deep Jewish roots and deep Greek roots, and everybody was all mixed together. So uh, elevation of wisdom, though, is strong in this community, like the the value, they valued this idea of wisdom. Uh, and that was most likely attributed to the stronger Greek cultural influence and then the smaller Jewish one, right? So he was really combating this. You keep reading, when, and he's going to talk about man's wisdom and God's wisdom and, and all wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. He keeps talking about that because that was so valued by that culture. That is the backdrop to Paul's description of his approach as he preaches in Corinth. So in the first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, let's read that together. He says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And there's our trembling. In fact, we see fear, weakness, and trembling. <laughs> Was he afraid of the Corinthians? Was he trembling in front of them? Let's explore this a little bit further and see what we can come up with. So let's take the bite of comparing and contrasting here because Paul is working hard to show the contrast of his chosen style or his chosen approach to the culture of the day. Trembling was part of his approach. It wasn't a tactic, but it was a response to the truths he was sharing. So what words or phrases described what was expected by the audience? I put lofty speech, lofty wisdom, plausible words of wisdom. Earlier in chapter one, he used the phrase words of eloquent wisdom. So what words or phrases described his chosen kind of proclamation style. And I say it that way because he was he was proclaiming the testimony of God. Well, he decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Weakness, fear, trembling, uh, and his speech and message were the opposite of plausible words of wisdom. So let's take a minute here to take the bite of examining the text in various translations because I'm asking myself the question, what does Paul mean by plausible words of wisdom? And one way to explore a question like this further is to see how other translation teams translate this verse. In my favorite tool, again, BibleHub.com, you just type in the verse, and it has to be one verse for the parallel feature to work. And then we see this. The NIV says, wise and persuasive words. The New Living Translation says Paul's message and preaching were plain rather than using clever and persuasive speeches. The King James Version says enticing words of man's wisdom. 
And the New King James says persuasive words and human wisdom. Now, he knew that he could use all of the first list. By the way, did you see that? (laughs) Did you see us using that bite of making a list? One of my favorite bites is to make a list. But he could use lofty speech and wisdom, eloquence, clever and persuasive speeches to get the message of Christ to the people. But he didn't. He brought it back to the basics. He decided to know nothing among them except Jesus and him crucified. Did he know nothing except for that? No way. I mean, he was a very learned man. He studied under a well-respected rabbi. But Paul set all of that aside to preach the message of the cross. Why? Because he wanted them to put their faith in Christ, not in his ability to persuade. So is weakness, fear, and trembling his his presentation style in this moment? Uh, like, Like a tactic where I'm saying it's not a tactic, but was it a tactic or was it a reflection of something deeper? And I'm saying it's much deeper. It was not a tactic. It was a deep seated understanding of how weak and small he really was. When I take the bite of doing a word study on that word tremble, here's what I discover. It's used to describe the anxiety of one, of someone who distrusts his ability completely to meet all requirements, but religiously does his utmost to fulfill his duty. Paul's weakness and fear and trembling reflected his understanding that he wasn't enough, but he was going to be faithful anyway. And he wasn't going to fall into the trap of depending upon his knowledge and his talents, although he had much knowledge and great talent. In fact, he set those aside so that they wouldn't distract from the power of the message. And they weren't enough anyway, is what he's trying to say. It would be a travesty if the, if the Corinthians placed their faith in him rather than in the power of God. And so we too, when we consider all that we know about the Lord, we should tremble with reverential fear and a clear understanding that our strength is laughable. Our wisdom is just silly to God, the God of all wisdom and all power. But that's not the rest of the story. Keep reading and you will see that as you make yourself really low and look up at our God, you will see the Lord of glory and the words of verse 9 that were first written through the prophet Isaiah. It says, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And at that idea and the glory of God, I tremble. So what's next? We'll read and meditate on Psalm 2. Let it launch you back into 1 Corinthians or go there for the first time if you if you didn't take the challenge last week. Ponder the cultural surroundings of the Corinthians. Maybe hop over to Acts 18 to take that in. Contrast your observations with our culture today as you move into what the truths of this text might mean for you today. And in your prayer time this week, set aside every thought except that of Christ and him crucified and see how that may change the way you think. And the next time you enter into the glorious presence of God, don't boast and don't beg. Just worship and tremble. And while you're in God's word this week, let me know how you're doing. Email me, michelle at michellekneezat.com. Hop on Twitter at michellekneezat, Instagram at michellekneezat, or on Facebook, Michelle L. Nizat is my public page. And let's talk about what you're learning. Now, More Than a Song is a proud member of the NRT Podcast Network, a network of podcasts associated with New Release Today. If you head over to newreleasetoday.com, you could take advantage of all things Christian music, from lyrics to reviews and more. Now, if you haven't joined the 30-day music challenge yet, I highly recommend it. The challenge is to listen exclusively to Christian music for 30 days. You are never too late to jump in. Just submit your name and email address at michellekneezat.com forward slash 30-day challenge and you're in.
Now, before I tell you what song will be featured next week, I want to thank any new subscribers to my website, like Benedict from the Philippines and Betty from North Carolina. Welcome. And just to let you know, new subscribers to my website benefit from a one-page resource of my top five bites. I think this is going to be really valuable for you as you get started with all of that. Subscribers also benefit from an email that I send once a week. And in that email, you get a weekly memory verse resource to display on your smartphone, tablet, desktop, or you can print it out. You get an email recap of the week's episode with all of the live links to the additional resources that I use to prepare for the episode. You also will get instant access to any of the extra resources that I create from time to time for my episodes. All of that is just my way of saying thank you for listening. So head over to michellenizat.com to subscribe today. Now, have you had a chance to write a review in iTunes for the podcast yet? Uh, This encourages me, of course, but it also helps me stay visible to new listeners. And as always, if you take the time to review my podcast, I will take the time to personally thank you right here on the podcast. Just like Kim, who wrote a review after listening to episode 401, where I used the song Rattle to inspire us to learn more about the prophet Elijah. She writes, I just heard my first podcast from Michelle. Wow, I love how she gave the whole context of Elisha. Thank you for drawing such a picture that allows us to see and feel the word of God. I can't wait to binge on more than a song. Thank you, Kim, for your review. I can feel the excitement that you have of diving into scripture, and I can't wait to be a part of that journey with you. Now, I have a new tool. If you want to leave a review or even a testimony like this one, just go to lovethepodcast.com forward slash more than a song. Of course, you can listen to the podcast directly on my website at michellekneesat.com through iTunes or the Apple Podcast app. You can follow on Spotify or through Stitcher Radio or your podcast listening app of choice. Well, that's it for this episode of More Than a Song. Next week, I will be using Rejoice by Andrew Ripp to jump into scripture. If you liked this episode, however, would you mind sharing it with others? It's really easy. With just one click, you can share via Facebook, Twitter, or email. Just head over to michellekneesat.com forward slash 403. While you're there, I'd love to hear from you. Click on comment to join the conversation. Until next time, take time to meditate on God's word and consider his ways.